Hello again, I am Blunty, and amongst Intel's new 7th generation CPUs lives an underdog which does something no other of its ilk has done in quite some time. It's the i3, the lowest end of the Intel Core CPU line, and the new KB Lake i3-7350 has that special little K after its model number, indicating a CPU capable of being overclocked, at least as long as it's in an appropriate Z100 or Z200 series motherboard. In my case, it's a Gigabyte Z170N Gaming 5 Mini ITX motherboard, which had a BIOS update to make it compatible with the new KB Lake CPUs. In fact, this motherboard had the previous generation of i3 chip in it, the Skylake 6100, which of course gives me an ideal opportunity to do some head-to-head -head shootout stuff. Now, both the non-overclockable Skylake and the new KB Lake i3s are dual-core, but with Intel's hyper-threading, they run four threads, making them useful as the heart of a budget gaming rig. The architectural upgrade from Skylake to KB Lake is more about efficiency and extra I.O. lanes and the like, and when comparing the i3s, i5s and i7s alike between the generations, it is only moderate when it comes to performance increases. Except for that magic K. This new i3 is overclockable, which begs the question, how much faster is the 7350K over the 6100, and how much can you stretch that gap if you twist its nipples right off with a big fat overclock? Now, out of the box, the i3-7350K is clocked at 4.2 GHz, which already gives it a slight advantage over the 3.8 clock of the 6100. And to my rather broad surprise, the 7350K absorbed a very significant overclock. In fact, like the i7-7700K KB Lake I recently took a poke at, the humble i3 let me kick it all the way up to 5 GHz without complaint, with only a slight push to the CPU voltage to 1.35 volts. In fact, at 1.45 volts, I was able to push it to a stable 5.2 GHz, a full 1 GHz overclock above stock clocks. And the only reason I didn't keep it there for tests is because with the all-in-one 240 water cooler I've got in the rig, I couldn't quite manage the heat generated at those voltages. While the 5.2 overclocker didn't ever crash out on me, it would, especially under benchmarking loads, hit thermal limits and slow itself down automatically. With a more significant cooler, it's not hard to imagine I could keep it at 5.2 GHz without much worry at all, but then again, if you're going to be spending bigger on fancier coolers for the sake of CPU performance on an overclocked i3, it may be time to think about the i5 or the i7 instead. So I moved the chip back down to a cooler 1.35 volts and the flat out 5 gigahertz overclock. Things were fine and dandy in the temperature department, only going as high as 70 degrees under full CPU loads and about 60 degrees also on average under mixed benchmarking loads. And for the record, by the way, those temperatures were obtained while testing on a hot, and I mean a hot, Sydney summer day. It was about 30-something degrees outside. Amperage temperature inside my apartment without AC was a toasty 28 degrees. So while the Thermaltake cooler I'm using couldn't quite manage the extra high voltages needed for 5.2 GHz, it was kicking ass otherwise. Anyway, as for what the overclock actually does, well, I've paired it up with a GTX 1060 as that mid-range 10 series card seems like a logical, higher sensible choice for an i3 based rig. TimeSpy sees a boost in score of about 5% for the OC to KB Lake over the Skylake i3, with a 10 degree increase in average core temperature. In Firestrike, it's a 10% boost from Skylake to KB. And even at stock speeds, the slight boost from the KV Lake was enough to push the results just above the spec line for VR. The Heaven benchmark was a bit odd, a jump in minimum FPS, but a slight drop in max. I ran the test a few times to see what was up, and Heaven is more reliant on GPU than CPU, but overall it gave sort of a negligible difference. In Valley, there's a consistent but quite moderate jump in scores, as you may expect from this slightly more CPU-sided mixed benchmark. And Cinebench's test, focused exclusively on CPU performance, tells the cleaner story of the KB Lake chip's speed advantage. Again, this is probably mainly down to the frequency differences rather than the actual architectural differences from Skylake. Kind of cool and interesting to note though, when overclocked, the i3-7350K scores above a mobile i7 chip from a few years ago. And finally, in the last of the canned benchmarks, Geekbench's CPU test reveals a jump of over 25% from the single-core performance of the Skylake chip from the KB Lake overclock. 
and just over 30% boost in the multi-core score. But making the move to the real world stuff now, Rise of the Tomb Raider, not an especially CPU demanding game in very high settings, shows in its own internal benchmark there's barely anything in it. Even when overclocked, maxed frame rates stay pretty close, while minimum frame rates do see a bit of a pickup. And in actual gameplay, the KB Lake does have a slight lead, but it's only a few frames here and there. The story's not too different in the very well optimized Doom. Here, under ultra nightmare level settings, it's difficult to pull the scores apart. But like with Tomb Raider, it does seem to reach just a little higher a little more often with the overclocked i3. In very high settings in Mafia 3, it shows a general advantage of the 7350K's higher clock speeds again. By now, you should be seeing a pattern, as expected. Because many games aren't especially CPU bound, there's a small but measurably noticeable boost to frame rates under normal gameplay conditions. This of course is also true when you compare gameplay frame rates between stock clocks and overclocks on i5s and i7s. Watch Dogs 2 in very high settings defaults, except for motion blur, which I hate, is turned off, and the San Francisco fog, which I like, is turned on. Now, this game is somewhat tougher on the CPU than most, as I found out quite starkly with my i5 to i7 comparisons, and it really does like more cores to play with, but even here on the humble but feisty i3s, it runs quite nicely. And while low and average frame rates stick about the same between the three tests, again, the overclock does let us reach higher more often. So the general conclusion goes something like this. The overclockability of the new i3 doesn't make a huge difference in most games, but you can see it. It is, of course, of far more benefit, though, with CPU-intensive tasks, as we saw on the benchmarks. In context, here, as the core of a budget-minded gaming machine, what that means is it'll give you a little extra processing headroom for doing things like Twitch streaming. Which, if you're skeptical about using an i3 to stream to Twitch, I have proven before in a video the i3 is indeed absolutely capable of handling that job. Also, if you're recording your game footage locally for YouTube or whatever, the overclocked KB Lake will make processing your video, editing and encoding noticeably faster too, as that is a heavily CPU reliant task. Two things to remember here though. First, if you plan to overclock, make sure you go with a decent aftermarket cooler. The stock Intel cooler that will come with the retail chips isn't ideal for dealing with the above normal heat. You can actually get away with a bit of an overclock with a stock cooler. They're much better these days than they used to be. But seriously, just get a decent aftermarket cooler. And secondly, if, like me, you're planning on jamming it into a Z100 series motherboard, do make sure that motherboard is one that has a BIOS update available to make it compatible with the new KB Lake CPUs. Otherwise, it won't work. That all. Or you could just get a Z200 series board, which of course are designed and made specifically for the KB Lake chips. And do make sure it's a Z-series motherboard. Those ones allow you to overclock.
At the end of the day, it's pretty neat to have an overclockable i3 back in the world again. There's nothing quite like pulling a free 5 to 30% performance boost out of thin air on budget level gear to make a tech nerd smile. Thanks for watching, hope this has been interesting, informative, or useful. I am Blunty, and I'll catch you next time.